Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend the warmest welcome to members of ACAP, Golden Age Foundation, and friends from different parts of the world. Despite the traveling restrictions under COVID, this virtual event has given us a valuable opportunity to bring global cities together, to exchange information, develop good practices, and foster collaboration. Hong Kong and many Asian countries are enjoying much longer lives, which offer great opportunity for individuals and the wider society. But the pandemic has exposed the lack of preparedness of our aging societies. The medical and elderly care systems were on the verge of collapse earlier this year in Hong Kong, and the death toll among the elderly has been on the rise here and elsewhere. The physical and mental health of older persons globally have been adversely affected. Profound demographic changes mean that the world's filling up with older people, with Japan and Hong Kong at the forefront, with almost a quarter of our populations now moving into retirement. Japan has taken the lead in tackling the needs of aging society by setting up the Council for Designing 100-Year Life Society, which is an expert group set up to prepare for a rise in the number of centenarians. There are positive developments in Singapore in promoting smart aging, as we have heard yesterday from our Singaporean counterparts. The Chinese government has also implemented a pilot long-term care insurance reform in the country. But how about the rest of Asia? We must also begin to plan for a future in which the traditional three-stage life of study work and retirement no longer applies. There could also be opportunity within the challenges of an aging society. I always feel that it is not enough to reimagine or rethink society to become longevity ready. We must build it with new experiments, with new mindset, and we must build it fast. The policies and investments we undertake today will determine how the current young become the future old and whether we can make the most of the extra years of life that has been handed over to us. So with this, I look forward to hearing from this section from our experts from ACAP who will let us to rethink how we can rebuild and recover from the challenges presented by the pandemic with a better and fairer development for older persons. So thank you very much, panel of speakers. I look forward to hearing from you soon. So I will pass the mic to our facilitator, Professor Teresa Tian. Thank you so much, Rebecca for your introduction. It's really my great honor to be invited to be the facilitator for this session on, is Asia ready for a 100 year life? This is such an important topic as it concerns all of us and we are all living longer. I'm sure that we prefer to live a healthier, happier, and independent life. So how can individuals and societies be prepared for it? So this session is so important and is co-presented by Golden Age Foundation and Active Aging Consortium Asia Pacific. I'm an executive committee member of, and also the Hong Kong representative of ACAP. As our president, Professor Catherine Brown is traveling at this time. In her absence, I would like to welcome all our ACAP members to this session. So on behalf of ACAP, we would like to thank Rebecca, chairman of Golden Age Foundation for this opportunity to co-organize the session. A warm welcome to ACAP and non-ACAP members. 
For those of you who may not know ACAP, I would like to share with you a few slides about ACAP. Okay, this is the poster for this session. And we are very happy to be a partner of Golden Age Foundation to organize this um, session. For ACAP, we have more than 700 members all over the world. We have members, you can see that from India, Nepal, and all the way to Canada and to Europe. And these all together, you know, they come from 22 countries. Who are we? What do we do? Our mission is to share friendship and best practices for active aging. So our members include academias, we have um, policy makers, we have practitioners, we have researchers, retirees and caregivers. And this mission is, you know, we share the best practice policies and uh, on active aging from different geographies and countries. We organize annual meetings and monthly webinars for members and non-members. As a member, you will receive information of our monthly webinar by monthly bulletin. So you're also welcome to contribute articles, you know, to our by monthly bulletin. So it sounds good, right? Well, the best has yet to come is that there is no membership dues for ACAP and participation is free. So please browse our website for more information. And in the coming months, we are organizing a lot of webinars on different topics. And the next one in September will be Rise of older people. So how to be a member is so easy. You just need to send an email to Taryn. Uh, Taryn's email address is there. So you can copy down and then you can send it. Yeah, so we welcome all of you to be our members. Okay, let me stop sharing and continue. So without further ado, I would like to move on to today's presentation. Why is today's topic so interesting and so important? As we all know that due to medical service, technology, better nutrition and advance in sanitation and public health, our average lifespan today can reasonably exceed like 20 to 30 more years than our parents. Life expectancy in developed and de developing countries are increasing. The United Nations predicted that the number of centenarians worldwide will rise to 573,000 people in 2022. And another population statistics also state that by 2050, nearly 60% of the world's older people will be living in Asia. So is Asia ready for this? Well, issues and challenges such as the new definition of old, growing old, healthcare, family structure, urban design, financial, sustainability, housing, technology, civil market, social policy and services, et cetera, will need to be addressed. So in this session, we have experts from China, Japan, Italy, and Hong Kong. And these are homes to some of the highest percentage of centenarians. They will share the research findings their visions and response to some of the above challenges. 
So uh, just before we start, uh, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions, please send to the Q&A box. And if you would like your questions to be answered in case we cannot entertain your question, please put down your email address and we'll try to reply to you later. So the first speaker today is Professor Du Peng from China. Professor Du Peng is Vice President of Renmin University of China. He is also a director and professor of the Institute of Gerontology, Renmin University. He is Vice President of China Gerontology and Geriatric Society and China Population Association. He has been the board member of Help Age International for eight years and board member of United Nations International Institute on Aging since 2008. His research interests are population aging and aging policies. His publications include the process of population aging in China, aging issues and policies in EU countries, population aging, changes and challenges. Professor Du is really an expert on population aging in China. But today, I'm sorry to inform you that uh, he is traveling at this time, but he has kindly sent in his pre-taped presentation. His topic is the current situation and trend of centenarians in China. He will give us the most updated global statistics on centenarians and report how China is coping with the trend of growing centenarians. So please stay tuned. Thanks, Chair uh, Teresa. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to talk about is Asia ready for a hundred years? Uh, my topic is on the centenarians in China about the trend policy and services. The latest data shows the current world global st statistics on centenarians around 2020. It's quite interesting to see the rapid uh, development of the longevity in the world. Uh, according to the data released last week by the United Nations Population Division, by World Population Prospects 2022 version, for the global data, we have uh, more than 547 centenarians around the world. That's 547,000 centenarians around the world. And China, according to the latest census data in 2020, for the first time, we have the largest number in the world. That's 118,866 centenarians in 2020. It's very big change since the 10 years ago, the last census. The second will be uh, United States. According to the census data uh, by the US Census Bureau, it's uh, a little bit more than 100,000 in the United States. In the past decades, United States was always the number one for the centenarian size in the world. But this time, on 2020, China has a larger number than the United States. And the third will be Japan, according to the uh, data by Japanese government released in September uh, 2020, uh, Japan had uh, 80,000 centenarians. And then in yeah, other Asian countries, Korea, has more than 20, almost 22,000 centenarians, uh, a, a little bit 
bigger than that is Indian numbers. So totally, almost the, even in Asia, we, has, we have about half of the centenarians in the world. So that's the global data and the Chinese data uh, told us. Secondly, we can uh, have a more close look at the Chinese centenarians from the past seven uh, population census. Uh, from 1953, we had uh, only 3,300 centenarians. And 10 years ago, that was uh, 35,000, almost 36,000 in 20. 10. And in, in just uh, 10 years, we can see the very rapid develop, development. We have uh, almost four times larger numbers uh, for centenarians. So we are entering uh, aging society, but uh, as well as uh, longevity society period. So that's the total number in China in the past seven decades. Even though we can, uh, that's from the uh, number of centenarians, but another perspective, when we have a look at the uh, percentage of the centenarians in different uh, population, it's another picture. Uh, so uh, centenarians per 100,000 population in some leading countries in, uh, in longevity, we can see uh, the top one is still Japan. Uh, for every 100,000 population, Japan has uh, more than 63 centenarians, the highest percentage in the world, followed by France, uh, UK, and uh, also the USA, Germany, uh, Korea, so for China, even we have uh, the largest number of centenarians in the world now, but for percentage, we are still uh, pretty low comparing to Japan. So in the next decades, we will see the increase of the, the centenarians uh, number, but also we look forward having higher percentage of the centenarians in the total population. That's the international differences across countries on the percentage of centenarians. Another perspective is even domestic difference is very uh, apparent. So uh, for the 31 provinces in the mainland China, excluding uh, Chinese uh, Hong Kong, Macau and uh, Taiwan province. Uh, in the, the other provinces, uh, Hainan has the Hainan province has the uh, highest percentage in China in 2020. For every 100,000 uh, uh, population, they have uh, more than 27 centenarians. Uh, so we can see that's in the southern uh, part of China. The other followed province is Heilongjiang to the north. Uh, it's about uh, almost uh, uh, 20 uh, percent uh, per 100,000 population. For the centenarians, uh, they, they have uh, almost uh, 19 centenarians. Uh, so on average for the whole country is 8.43, uh, almost 8.4 uh, centenarians per 100. Uh, thousand population. So we can see even we when we compare the total number of the country, uh, we have a quite different size, but also uh, cross country and uh, even uh, compare reason in China itself, we have a quite uh, obvious uh, difference across the country and across the provinces. Fourth, we will talk about uh, to deal with the, to cope with the challenge of population aging, especially in the new era. Uh, we have uh, uh, more and more old people, so they live into their centenarian, uh, 100 years old, 
and also more uh, numbers in their 80s, 90s. What's the policies in China to cope with the population aging? So from the policy perspective, the Chinese government have always attached great uh, importance to the issues of population aging and focused on responding actively to it as a strategic level. Uh, I will list some key uh, policies in the past 10 decades, uh, decade, uh, in the past one decade, uh, about 12 years in, in the past uh, decade. So in 2000, year 2000, when China became an aging society, that means for those uh, 65 over population, they, uh, uh, they were 7% uh, in the year of 2000. So the CPC central government and the state council issued the decision on taking, on taking efforts to tackle population aging in China. So just in the same year as China became an aging society. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had the national medium and the long-term uh, plan uh, actively coping with population aging. That's the central, by the central government, and also there's a national strategy, as a national strategy to uh, list the aim, uh, what we should achieve by 2022, by 2035, and uh, until 2050. So that's the national plan for tackling uh, with uh, population aging. Two years ago, in the fifth plenary session of the 19th uh, Party Central Committee, they elevated uh, coping with population aging to uh, the, the national policy to a national strategy level. So that's the first time in history we have a, a strategic level, uh, national strategic level policy to deal with the uh, population aging. So that's another uh, development in the past uh, two decades uh, since tw year 2000. Last year, in 2021, when China entered an aged society, that means for those 65 and over, they crossed 14% in China last year. The CPC Central Committee and the State Council issued the guideline for measures on efforts to tackle population aging in new era. Especially they listed the, the, the concrete measures in the next three and four years, what the, the people can uh, get for their support for the, uh, the care of the elderly and also what should the economic development aim to cope with the public aging, how to uh, have a more creative uh, technology implementation or utilization to complement the shrinking labor force in the next uh, four or five years. So this is uh, the uh, a list of the Chinese policy development on aging in the past two decades. And then uh, if we give a more specific uh, uh, introduction, uh, we can list uh, as uh, services, the national for services, the national aging and the elderly service system plan for the uh, 14th five year plan period was issued the last year to have the very detailed uh, aim to achieve. For example, for the nursing bed in the, in the uh, residential care, they must uh, be over 55% in by 2025. For health, we have the second, the healthy aging plan for the 14th five-year plan. Uh, the last one was the 13th, 13th 
uh, five-year plan announced uh, about 80 years ago. So uh, that's, this is the second one to cope with the national uh, plan for healthy China. That's the national scheme. We have a very detailed healthy aging plan for the next four years. For age-friendly environment, we have the guidelines on the promotion of a livable environment for the elderly. That was issued in 2016 and uh, creating a social and uh, cultural environment that represent, respects the and owners the elderly. Uh, that's five years ago. Uh, it is highlighted in the se uh, several policy document, uh, documents. That's from the culture uh, and age-friendly environment perspectives. And then for the services for the elderly in China, the principle of the Chinese government on elderly services is building an elderly service system and a health support system that coordinate home, community, and institution services and combine medical care and social care. So that's the national aim to, for the elderly services uh, for their care and the support and enabling the elderly to enjoy services in their neighborhood, in their home and at their bedside. We call that uh, Sanbian in Chinese. By the end of 2021, there were over 357,000 elderly service institutions and facilities in China with over 8.13 million buys half of which currently are nursing buys. In the next five years, the percentage will be 55% uh, for the nursing buys promotion. China also launched a pilot long-term care insurance scheme in 2016 and extended it to 49 cities in 2020. As of the first half of 2021, the cumulative amount of the funds raised for long-term care insurance reached 76 billion yuan, and the size of the insured population is about 140, uh, 140 million. Uh, the national uh, long-term care insurance, uh, the national scheme is trying to be set up by 2025, uh, that's the national plan. Uh, so currently we are summarizing the experiences and the lessons from the current 90, uh, 49 pilot cities. Uh, we will see that's a very uh, uh, creative insurance scheme to promote uh, more professional care for the elderly at their home. And then I want to mention silver technology and, uh, and aging finance in China, the development for the latest technology and uh, finance. The Chinese government has proposed to strengthen the capacity for scientific and technological innovation in coping with population aging, and has proposed to make technological innovation and the as the first the driving force and the, the strategic support in actively coping with population aging. So uh, for the, uh, I'm, as I mentioned in the medium and the long-term uh, uh, active aging plan, uh, and the uh, first uh, uh, among the main uh, efforts, we have the technology innovation as the first driving force. So that's the, it's also very important measure to cope with the population aging in China. It's included in the national strategic plan. And then to reduce the impact of the digital divide on older people, uh, the Chinese government issued the in implementation plan for effectively solving the difficulties facing the elderly in the use of intelligent technologies in 2020. As you know, uh, from the beginning of 2020, uh, the 
the for the services uh, of the elderly, more and more digital technology was used uh, in the public services. And many older people, although China, uh, mainland China is the biggest uh, part in the world for the elderly, using the IT technology, uh, the internet, we have currently, we have a more than 100 uh, and 20, uh, 130 million old people, they are using the uh, uh, mobile phone on internet. But uh, again, more than 50% of the people, they never use the internet. So to help them uh, to in the COVID-19 uh, epidemic uh, prevention, so the Chinese government issued the current uh, document to require the uh, provision of the, uh, the mobile phones or other uh, uh, facilities to be age-friendly for the elderly so that they can use these technologies in their daily life. And then another government uh, policy is the action plan for the development of the smart house and aging industry. That's the five-year plan uh, from 2021 to 2025, which was issued in, in last year. And then another China's basic pension insurance fund has officially launched the market-based investment operations since the end of 2016. Uh, that means by we firstly we de developed the basic pension insurance. And then at the same time, we, we encouraged the enterprise insurance. And then uh, from last year, the government is trying to encourage the private investment, a uh, private pension. So that's a, a development in the past two decades. China's basic pension insurance fund, uh, the total investment amount of the uh, pension insurance fund was 1.46 trillion yuan by the end of last year. And the cumulative investment return during 2017 to 2020 was about 200 billion yuan. It's a very huge fund in China with an average annual investment return rate of 6.89%. The scale and uh, the second part of the national uh, insurance plan is the enterprise annu annuities, which uh, was reached uh, 2.64 trillion yuan uh, achieving an investment return of uh, 124.2 billion yuan and an uh, investment return rate of 5.33% by the end of last year. And also this year, just uh, three years ago, the, the, the State Council issued uh, the, a new document called opinions on promotion or on promoting the development of, of private pensions. So that means they try to encourage the third pillar in the national pension scheme so that the for the elderly they can invest on that and then uh, when they get the uh, when they retire they have uh, more pension support not just from the uh, basic pension system or enterprise pension, they can have their private pension scheme. That's the uh, introduction about the centenarians in China. First, I, I report about the latest centenarians uh, number and then followed to introduce to cope with the population aging in China what policies and what concrete measures for technology or finance or and the services, the measures taken in China and uh, from the latest uh, five-year plan until 2025 was the main uh, goal of the Chinese government to try to achieve. 
Thank you for your watching. Well, thank you very much, Professor Zhu, for sharing the most updated global statistics on centenarians. Your sharing on how China is preparing for the enormous number of centenarians certainly has a lot of learning points for other countries. So thank you so much. So the next speaker is Dr. Takio Ogawa from Japan. Dr. Ogawa is Emeritus Professor, Yamaguchi University and Kyosu University in Japan. He is a representative of the Voluntary Association Asia Aging Business Center. He is the Emeritus Member of the Japan Social Gerontological Society. And Dr. Ogawa is the founder and first president of ACAP, Active Aging Consortium in Asia Pacific, who is one of the organizers of this session. He is a committee member of the Fukuoka City Master Planning Council and Council of Health and Social Welfare. Dr. Ogawa's topic today is Centenarian's Friendly City Tactics in Fukuoka City, Japan. So he will discuss the challenges as well as the tactics coping with the trend of centenarians in Fukuoka, Japan. Dr. Ogawa, please. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. I'm originally a sociologist. It was thought that centenarians uh, was uh, persons of uh, extremely unusual long time uh, for a long time ago. So in a centenarian studies, uh, researchers interested uh, focus on exploring the secrets of long life. First of all, uh, there was an uh, interest in the geographical places where uh, there are many long lived people. It's carried uh, over by the current concept of the blue zone. In addition, people with long lives uh, were interested in uh, lifestyle habits, such as psychological characteristics and eating habits. Uh, from here, the concept of the healthy food led to the development of the various products. However, from the uh, viewpoints of the sociologists, uh, the reality that the population of over age 100 increased rapidly to become a normal social phenomenon, we will have to take consideration how to design such longevity society. In Japan, the government has uh, measures to uh, celebrate uh, people who have reached at the age of 100. Based on reports from the municipalities across the country, the government award, uh, awards uh, gold caps uh, for them. At this time, uh, the numbers of over age 100 uh, will also be reported. When the system began in 1963, there were only uh, 20 men and 133 women over the age of 100. At that time, the total population of Japan was uh, 96 million. So uh, they were rare existences. However, Japan's population has been aging since 1970. And since uh, 1995, it has become an aged society. And the population of about 100 years old rapidly increases. In addition, Japan entered the uh, uh, super aged society stage in 2006. And the population over 100 years old will increase. In 2021, uh, last year, there were 10,000 
and 60 men and 76 and uh, 450 women. In this way, a society where it's common to live to the age of 100 has been realized in Japan. Not only that, but this trend will become more and more intensifying in the future. According to the National Institute of the Population and the Social Security Research, by 2050, the populations of 532,000 people over age 100 will live in Japan. In Asia, older persons are cared by family household normally, but we will be not able to uh, expect family care for centenarians. The concept of the Japanese uh, household is defined by cohabitations and sharings of livelihoods. Those who have been admitted to long-term care facilities were having hospitalized uh, for more than three months, uh, uh, classified as a household life, such as facilities. The census shows that the population over the age 100 is included in the uh, populations over age uh, 95 on the household situation. It can be said that follows. 45.5 persons of the populations over age uh, 95 live in institutions, long-term care facilities, and hospitals. More than 24.1 persons of over age 95 had in an extended family type household with children and grandchildren. 14.3% of the populations over the age of 95 live alone. More than 12.6% uh, of over age uh, 95 is a two generation family uh, known as a nuclear family. 3.1% of the over the age 95 live in household only with spouse. I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Uh, Kane Tanaka, who was one of the typical centenarians in Japan. She was a Fukuoka citizen. She was born in 1903 and died this year in uh, 2022 at the age of 119. She was a long-lived Guinness World Record holder. She was born the fourth of nine children and was married and has four children. After working in a family business, she established and ran a kindergarten. She retired at the age of 63. She was various diseases, but she survived. And when she was 103 years old, she also had cancer surgery. She entered a free based, a fee based residential home at the uh, age of 102. Here, he enjoyed a game called Othero and solved calculation uh, tasks to prevent dementia. Her favorite foods were soda drinks and chocolate. She was working in the facility until just before she died. When considering the age of 100 years of life, the increase in the number of such people highlights a social issue that must be put more effort than every, ever before. Now, uh, there are over uh, 700 centenarians 
in the Fukuoka city now, how will we care for increasing centenarians? Oh. At the age of 100 years of life comes normal, on the one hand, issues of the individual effort will be expected. How can we design work and life? How can we maintain the ability in our later life? Who will be cared for us? Who will help protect our dignity as a person? What kind of the happiness do we seek? How do we die? How can we utilize ICT, IoT, labs, and AI? These issues are an individual challenge. On the other hand, Area that require the effort of a society very much. How do we try to displace the population? How can we prepare the ageless work? How do we perceive livestock, wild animals, and human health issues in an integrated manner? How do we promote uh, preventive health? How do we secure human resources to engage in the care work? How can we make sure we can withdraw money from the bank even when we have dementia? How can we avoid abuse of the elderly? How do we realize the ideas of the worth living that Japanese people pursue? How should we proceed with funerals and the cemetery measures suitable for the uh, death-laden era? These social, uh, social issues are immediate uh, in the age of 100 years of life. Then, in preparations for the uh, alive of the 100 years life era, Fukuoka City decided to raise up with the concept of Fukuoka 100 in 1917. This initiative uh, promotes uh, 100 action to achieve a healthy social model anticipating uh, the era of 100 years of life. In order to build a sustainable city that delights in longevity, longevity we tackle for bring happiness uh, to each citizens and also to the city. Finding the mean the, uh, to strengthen relationships uh, between the local communities and the individuals by utilizing technologies. The Fukuoka 100 has set up uh, seven pillars to achieve its goals. The first of them is the trainings of the citywide caregivers. The practice and the disseminations of the scientific care are uh, trained not only for care professionals, but also for all citizens, particularly for realizing for dementia-friendly city programs such as workplace developments uh, that can work even with dementia. Easy to understand the facility design and simple testing method of dementia or bond. The second of them is building integrated uh, health hub. Development of big data and open data of health and long-term care is promoting. Health insurance and long-term care insurance generates a huge amount of health data. By integrating them and developing them as a big database, the businesses, citizens, and the governments will be able to act based on this data. Online prescriptions and online consultations of drugs have been made available, and it has been used in the COVID-19 era. The third of them is support for digital med uh, medical home. It aims uh, for enhancing home care structures with ICT. 
from now on, we are in an era where we can focus on the uh, developments of the information equipment and the software in order to manage our own health and be able to receive remote medical care at home. The fourth of them is Health Lab Initiative. Fukuoka City established Living Lab for co-creation new services and goods. Until now, many makers had been taking the initiatives in the development of products and services. But now we are in an era where we co-create products together uh, with customers. Health Lab uh, has developed uh, varieties of uh, service programs and products. For example, the NAP products were promoted by the health of uh, workers in job place and products for the uh, 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 purpose were also developed. The fifth of them is a constructions of the multi-generational community models. We are promoting the intergenerational activities and uh, when citizens reach uh, 70 years old, they need to start preparing for the uh, 100 years old life killer. So we are implementing the triggers as an expo, like as a Golden uh, uh, Age Foundation's expo. All the persons have secured the opportunity to work as long as possible. We are promoting collaboration with the corporate citizens. There are also suggestions for the new cemetery site. The sixth of them is the development of the care tech programs. We are innovating care technology. In the age of the 100 years of life, we will need a lot of the help hands. Labats are one of them. Improving the knowledge and the skills of the leaders is also the challenge. It's also important to provide the necessary funds. Program for startups in the care tech business have also implemented. The seventh of them is to aim for center of international aging care. We are supporting it for trainings and the circulations of foreign care workers from now on. The trainings of uh, long-term care professionals will be highlighted as an issues for the aging of Asia as a whole. In order to address these issues, Fukuoka City is promoting a migrant care worker support programs. In response to our goals of the making 100 initiatives by 2025, we have already launched uh, 89 business uh, by fiscal uh, years uh, 2021. And now in 2022, April, it reached uh, 993 projects. The Fukuoka 100 initiatives was announced at the Davos e Conference 2018 and the World Bank introduced it to the world at the conference in Chile uh, at uh, 2019. Then World Bank launched an age ready cities perspectives. And now Fukuoka city will be an affiliated city with it now. Currently, I'm the chairman of the committee of updating the design of the next Fukuoka 100. Eventually, after Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea will have to prepare for the arrival of the 100 years old life. At that time, I would appreciate it if you could refer to Japanese uh, movements, especially the experimental effort of 
the Fukuoka city. I would like to you to think of a society that you can say that you can uh, you are glad to live until you are 100 years old. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogawa, for your very inspiring presentation. The city of Fukuoka is definitely in the forefront in implementing this Fukuoka 100, which is such a comprehensive model to help your residents to live up to 100. I'm sure most countries will be interested to consider adapting this model for the people. And we very much look forward to your Fukuoka 102.0. Okay, thank you so much. And the third presentation, we have, um, there are two authors for the third presentation from Italy. Dr. Mauro Titamenti. Dr. Mauro Titamenti holds a degree in biological sciences at the University of Milan and a specialization in health statistics at the University of Pavia. He is currently the head of the Laboratory of Geriatric Epidemiology at the Mario Negri Institute of Pharmacological Research in Milan, Italy. His interests and ex expertise are in the field of dementia, where he carried out studies on the treatments of the disease. And since dementia incidence increases with age. His interest gradually shifts also to the study of the very old people, and in particular, the centenarians. And the second author is Professor Gabriella Macon. Professor Macon received her PhD in neurological sciences from the University of Verona. She is currently Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Trieste and uh, Udini, Italy, where she teaches neurology and human neuroanatomy. She has focused on neurodegenerative dementia in neuropathological diagnostics and in clinical and basic research, in particularly on Alzheimer's disease. So today the topic is being a centenarian in Trieste, Italy. And uh, Dr. Titamenti is going to share the results of how the previous lifestyles would link to the health status of the centenarians in Trieste. Dr. Titamendi, please. Thank you uh, to the organizers of this summit to invite us. My presentation will be on the study that we, me and Professor Gabriella Marcon set up eight years ago in Trieste, Italy. Why we thought it was interesting to do it, what we did and what we are still doing now, and what we found that our wishes for the near future. Uh, having seen the previous presentation, uh, we, I see that we, we, um, this can be seen just as a pilot study after the great results already presented by Professor Ogawa. Uh, before starting uh, our study on centenarians, we mainly worked on neurodegenerative diseases from two points of view, clinical and neuropathological, Professor Marcon, and statistical and epidemiological by me. Neurodegenerative diseases are diseases that affect the nervous system, and prominent among them is dementia. Dementia together with all its subtypes, is a devastating disease, both for the patient 
his her relatives and because of its high numbers also for society historically dementia was asserted as a medical condition in middle aged person around the, the age of 50 to 60 years since in, which, in this age class, it is easy to spot persons with the disease as they show a striking and fast decrease in their ability to carry out standard daily activities, such as shopping, remembering names and places or dressing, relative to their previous state. However, as the number of people ranging older age increased and research began to study more and more older persons, it became clear that the proportion of this condition continued to rise as people aged, as when you can see from the graph in Italy. We noticed that few oldest old population were studied on this condition, and in general, few studies were focused on the health and social characteristics of extremely old people. In Italy, centenarians were a rarity after the Second World War, counting 88 on a population of approximately 50 million. After 1950, this number, however, started to increase to reach 15,000 in 211 on a population of approximately 60 million. This means that in 70 years, we saw an increase in absolute times of 170 times from 88 to 15,000, and an increase in proportion of more than 1,000 times from two in a million to 2.5 in 10,000. In 2015, this number slightly decreased due to a drop in the number of babies born a century before, i.e. during First World War, 1914 to 1918, and uh, following so-called uh, Spanish pandemic. But it began era to rise again in 2020, notwithstanding the new COVID-19 pandemic. Forecasts for the future see a continuous increase in the number of centenarians, so that the number should reach 78,000 by 2050, less than 30 years from now. Since centenarians were an age segment of interest that was clearly understudied in Italy, we looked for a place where we could start a new population study, and we found one in Trieste. Trieste is a medium-sized city, counting um, approximately 200,000 uh, inhabitants, with a high percentage of centenarians relatively to Italy seven per 10,000 against three per 10,000, and highly heterogeneous background, different descent, people coming from North and Eastern and Southern Europe, different religions, Catholic, Hebrew, Orthodox, Lutherans, different languages, and different food habits inherited from specific cultures. These characteristics were coupled with the presence of a local health authority, specifically dedicated to Trieste, which responded positively to our call, giving us the possibility to carry out the research in, in uh, these subjects. The main aim of the study are to evaluate the proportion of the different diseases in the population of centenarians with particular, particular interest in dementia, to assess the use of pharmacological therapies, to understand the needs related to present disability, to study which are the past specific lifestyle that are possible risk or protective factors for a better health status at 100, and to collect specimens to investigate the bi biological basis of longevity. As we are always looking for a new partnership, these aims can be extended to new fields when experts from other disciplines start to collaborate with us, such in the, as in the case of oral pathologists. Our is a population-based study. This means that all centenarians living in Trieste are invited to join the study. The only exclusion criteria is deciding not to enter the study. 
all subjects are visited at place of resident residence by a physician, a psychologist, and an oral pathologist. A specific case report form is used to collect the data, both directly from the centenarians and from an informant, usually a child or nephew or a nurse of a nursing home. We collect data on cognitive and mood status, presence of diseases, pharmacological therapies, past and present lifetimes, and perform a complete visit of the mouth. Biological specimens are also collected. A population-based study on centenarians presents some peculiarity. The first and foremost problem is specific to the very nature of centenarians, the high mortality rate. Almost 40% of them die before their next birthday. And the fast change in their health condition that forces us to conduct all the visit in a short period of time, always taking into consideration the conditions and preferences of these persons. Other problems include the difficulty in interacting with a centenarian, since most of them have problems in hearing, seeing, or, or both. An additional problem lies in the fact that sometimes the centenarians has no direct connection to the outer world, so it is difficult to reach him or her, since some relatives tend to shield the centenarian against every change in his or her everyday life treating them like children in the, them, even when they have different wills. <clears throat> we report here uh, some results of the study. The study started in its first wave in 2013, and then we had other waves in 2017 and 2019. We could not visit centenarians during 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Another wave is currently starting. Women are the great majority, approximately nine women for one man, and this is in line with the other studies of centenarians. The majority of centenarians live in nursing home, while almost one in 10 lives alone. Almost all centenarians need help in the activities of daily living, and while approximately one in five is still independent in using a telephone and managing own finances and drugs, only 2% are completely independent of transportation. As expected, we found a massive presence of dementia, and more than half of the people we assessed has this diagnosis from mild to terminal stages. Centenaries in Trieste do not use a large number of drugs, and the proportion of subjects with five or more drugs taken chronically is relatively low. The prescription of many drugs is in general a problem due to the presence of pharmacological interaction among different drugs and to the increase in the possibility to experience a side effect, which clearly increases with the number of drugs. Moreover, since older subjects tend to have a reduced renal and liver function, this problem tend to be worse. Unlike younger elderly, uh, people aged between 65 and 80, centenarians tend to have less specialty visit than hospital admission, possibly signaling a relative low frequency in preventive measure that result later in the onset of acute condition to be treated in hospital. During the 2017 wave, a cardiologist visit the centenarians at their place of residence, carrying out a cardiologic assessment complete with electrocardiogram and echocardiography. Visited subjects were considered in a relatively good health condition especially considering their advanced age. Blood pressure was well controlled, and abnormal size were present in the majority of the subjects, both at electrocardiographic and echocardiographic examination. But most part of these abnormal signs were related to minor problems. 
interestingly, more than half of the population was not taking any cardiovascular drug, a somehow unexpected result, since this kind of drug is the most prescribed in elderly people. From 2017, an oral pathologist visits centenarians to assess the health condition of their mouth, collecting both subjective and objective data. Subjective data are relative to mouth pain, discomfort, and oral hygiene practice. Objective data are directly collected by the dentist and are relative to teeth and gum status, salivary flow, and taste perception. Oral microbiome, bacteria living in the mouth, are also analyzed to look for possible link between species and specific diseases. Centenarians were relatively satisfied with the condition of their mouth, and half of them practice or own oral hygiene every day. However, visit to the dentist, dentist were rather rare. Most part of centenarians did not have teeth anymore, and this condition has been, pre has been present for a mean of 30 years. We did not find any difference in rural characteristics between subjects with or without dementia, at, at least uh, until, uh, uh, until now. Uh, future directions of, of, uh, of our study. Uh, our study on Centenaries is currently recruiting new subjects in Trieste, and we hope to be able to invite all new Trieste centenarians to enter the study. In order for this to become feasible, a structure similar to a registry would be important, since in this way the study would be integrated into the data banks used to, to define local health authority targets. We are also planning to set up a new collaboration with other studies on centenarians in order to reach a large number of enrolled subjects. And we also would like to find new collaboration to explore new fields, both clinical and psychological ones. The number, uh, as I already said, the number of centenarians is bound to increase substantially in the next decades, as also will other very old populations such as nonagenarians, uh, i.e. people 90 years old uh, and more. It is therefore important to understand which are the prominent needs of this frail population in order to be prepared to meet, to meet them. Population-based studies are a perfect repository to extract data from. This data can be used to imagine new services to allow people to remain independent for a longer time than it is presently. For example, knowing that a very small minority of subjects are independent in transportation might trigger the creation of services to help in transferring people around the city or to facilitate the transportation of goods at home. Also, the knowledge that centenarians consume more medical acute care services than medical preventive services might trigger a campaign in search of possible signs and symptoms, harbingers of an impending crisis. Once the problem is clearly defined and evaluated, and the possible remedy is figured, the next move is to test the remedy for its effectiveness, acceptance, and cost-benefit ratio. Here again, a trial nested within study-based studies would provide a proper answer to the question linked to the need. Clearly, different mm -hmm. geographical or cultural settings may have different needs or may require different answers to the same need. Moreover, with the fast-moving technology that we see today, new answer can supersede the old answer in a few years. Becoming centenarians is a great achievement, but becoming an independent centenarian is a much better achievement. Thank you so much, Dr. Titamenti, for your very inspiring presentation. I really learned a lot, especially on the difficulties in conducting 
studies, you know, on centenarians because of the physical, mental changes. So especially during the COVID-19 days. So maybe you can, you know, share with us more later at our question and answer session. And I also like your idea of the registry concept. Uh, I think this is um, a very important milestone. Um, so maybe we can discuss more later on. But thank you so much for your presentation and also for uh, Professor Gabriela's contribution. So finally, the fourth speaker is uh, Dr. Justina Liu from Hong Kong. Dr. Liu is an Associate Professor of School of Nursing, Director of the Center in Gerontological Nursing, and Leader in Aging and Health Research Theme of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Her research program is about using Geron technology, such as virtual reality, wearable sensors and e-health technology to implement lifestyle interventions. Her topic today is, how are you doing on the healthy aging of the Hong Kong oldest old in the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic? It's, this is a very timely topic. So Dr. Liu will help us to understand how well the local oldest old are aging in Hong Kong, especially under the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Liu, please. Thanks for the nice introductions. Um, can you see my PowerPoint and hear me clearly? Can you see my PowerPoint? And yes. Okay. So um, firstly, I would like to thank for the organizer of the summit to invite me to join this a meaningful event. So um, here is the topics of my title. So uh, firstly, let's look at some figure. So um, due to the advancements of medical technologies and also the access to quality healthcare and also um, the hygiene, etc. The life expectancies of human beings in many countries have steadily increased during the past decades. So uh, I'm from Hong Kong, and Hong Kong has the highest life expectancy in the world. And the average life expectancy for female uh, was around 88 and 82 for males. And so we also have speakers from Japan and also Italy today. So uh, Japan has the second highest life expectancy and for Italy, it is ranked as seventh. So here is some figures about the Hong Kong populations in 2021. So the populations of Hong Kong uh, was around 7.5 million in 2021 in which about 20% of them were age 65 or about. So that means one in five people is age 65 or about in Hong Kong. And the percentage of those age 85 or about was around 3.19% of the total populations. And those are over 100 would be around 0.16% uh, of the total population. So um, because the life expectancies in Hong Kong keep rising, so as a result, the numbers of oldest old increase steadily. So but long uh, living long and aging well are two related but distinct concepts. So a great, uh, a great variation in health and also the functional status amongst the oldest old has been observed. While some of them are pretty frail, while many still maintain relatively healthy at their advanced age. So, and I borrowed the concept of WHOs about the healthy aging to explore the factors that can affect well being in the older soul. So, healthy aging is a process of maintaining and developing the functional abilities that can enhance the qualities of life in older people. So, good functional abilities relies on individual good intrinsic 
capacities and age-friendly environmental characteristic, as well as the interactions between these two factors. So the intrinsic capacities includes all uh, the biological, physical, mental, and psychosocial capacity. So for, for environmental factors include policy, transportation, housing, social protections, social facilities, and their relationship with friends and families and caregivers, etc. So um, to understand how well the local oldest old are aging, especially under the shadow of um, COVID-19 pandemic, so we invited 151 communities struggling oldest old share their wisdoms about their perceptions of being of aging well. So, and the data was collected between September and December 2020. This was around the third wave of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. And we adopted the multi-method research designs to measure as many factors as possible to understand how well our participants are aging. So for example, we use questionnaires to um, measure their subjective feeling. And we also use GPS and also the smartwatch to measure the older soul's daily uh, lifespan mobility and physical activities levels. And we also um, invited 22 participants who were relatively healthy among all participants based on the cross-sectional data to join the SAMI structures interview. So here is the demographic and clinical profile of all our participants. Um, for example, their mean age was around um, 89.8. The majority of them are females and the majority of them um, living with the families. And um, well, most of them carry at least one chronic disease and the most common types of disease would be hypertension. And um, they are, they are basically cognitively intact, which was reflected by the average AMT score was 8.5. And the cutoff score of AMT lower than six indicates cognitively impaired. So the majority of them actually are cognitively intact. Well, um, the findings from the questionnaires, well, and the simple physical examinations indicate that that's the majority of our participants were healthy in terms of no frailty, psychopenia, no hearings and vision impairment. And their functional capacities were found, which were factored by acceptable levels of their instrumental ADL score, their social participation score, the physical function score, and engagement in daily activity score. And their self-preserved qualities of life was also um, relatively good. So, and our participants was relatively happy, happy which was, um, which reflected by the higher happiness score with no depressive mood, well, reflected by the lower GSD goal, score. Well, however, about 52 point, uh, about, um, yes, about 52.9 percent of them were identified of being socially isolated, probably because of the social distancing policy during the COVID-19 when we collected our data. And because physical activity level is a very important indicator to reflect older people's health. So as we want to object measures the physical activities levels of our participants. So we ask them to wear an artigraph on their non-dominant hands for 24 hours for seven days. Was well, actually this artigraph just like a smartwatch, which can monitor the physical activity levels of our participants. But we only count 10 minutes of continuous uh, moderates to vigorous physical activities level because only such continuous uh, MVPA are considered beneficial by the WHO. Well, actually, I was so impressed when I first looked at these figures. So you can see on average, well, the numbers of daily count was around 9.6 thousand. And the highest numbers of uh, the daily step count could up to 11 thousand per day. And the average time spent on doing moderates to vigorous physical activity, activities level was around 38 minutes per day. So um, according to WHO recommendations, 
all the adults should at least do exercise for about 150 minutes per week. For example, they can do exercise for 30 minutes per day for five days a week. So we can see our participants can meet the WHO physical activity recommendations for older adults. So, and in this study, we also interesting to look at their lifespan mobility. So the lifespan mobility in this study is conceptualized as the area when an old person has traveled over specific period. So expanding within one home, so beyond one geographic regions. So, and we use Android-based maximum installed uh, with a GPS to monitor our participants' lifespan mobilities for seven days. So the participants were instructed to carry the smartphone with them continuously using the pouches provided by us, similar to this picture here. So, and the lifespan mobility was divided into four zones. So, zone ones, okay, so refers to within the apartment building, and zone two uh, refers to the neighborhood area. And soon three refers to within their living district. So, and soon four refers to outside their living district. So the finding from our surveys identified that our participants actually spent most of their time in Zoom one. So the mean percentage uh, of time spent in Zoom ones amongst our participants was around 84%. Zoom two was around um, 12.6 and Zoom three were up around 1.2 and Zoom four around 2.3. So as mentioned, we collected data around the third waves of COVID-19. So at that time, older adults were recommended to stay home to reduce their chances of being infected or spreading COVID-19. So, and this explains why they spend most of their time in Zoom ones within the apartment building to follow the instruction from a Hong Kong government. And that may also explain why they felt being socially isolated in the questionnaire part. So as mentioned, we invited 22 participants who was relatively healthy based on the data collected from the cross-sectional surveys to join the semi-structures interviews and here are their demographic data. So um, the first theme we have identified was, uh, was sustaining functional stability as the key to age well. So the interviewers believe that to live long, well, the priority was to maintain functional stability. So to them being able to walk around, to meet the basic need um, without, so, sorry. Okay. So, um, well, um, I mean, the interviews believe that to live long, the priority um, was to maintain their functional stability. So to them, being able to walk around to meet the basic needs and also with that much difficulty were signs of well-being. And they believe that this is a kind of blessing to them. So for example, uh, Mr. H replied, I feel I'm doing all right. Given this age, like I said, I am in the middle, not the best nor the worst. I am still able to move around and do stuff for myself on a daily basis. Well, is this expressing that I still have the abilities to do so? I'm grateful to myself that I am doing fine in completing my daily tasks. Well, actually the interviewees were focused not only on meeting their own basic needs as the primary goal of maintaining functional stability, they also mentioned some things beyond that. For example, Mrs. B, when asked about her perspective on how well she has been leading such a long life, she said, well, is this important to be able to help others? I do what I can to assist friends who need help. I help others and others help me too. I feel good. I still have the abilities to contribute to the society by volunteering. So, and having lived to such an advanced age, the interviewees has witnessed, well, it's actually different, you know, uh, economics and social hardships. So they have seen the most advanced scenarios and now facing the um, COVID-19 pandemics, and they refuse to break easily. So rather they endeavor to remain active and positive. So as stated by Mr. Aid, 
So uh, when you are at the age I am at, you have to let go. Stay simple and optimistic is the utmost importance because you can control your own emotions, can't you? If you get too bothered by the tedious of these and that, things can get too complicated and wrong. So when asked how the interviewees can stay active, Mr. N explained. So I exercise every day. I do hiking and sometimes jogging in the nearby park. We often go for dim sum well earliest in the morning, then exercise. I do long distance walking, you know, just to keep my body moving. So then staying at active was not about the body, but also the mind. So our interviewees were keen to keep their mind active by exercising their brain regularly. So for example, as Mrs. C said, I enjoy going to the market. I do that two or three times a week. So you know why? Because going there and buying food there can help to keep my brain active. You need to compare the prices, select the food, do the calculations. So you do not get dementia so easily if you keep using your brain, right? So, uh, and many of our interviewees receive different support from the families and also the society. They express uh, full gratitude for that support. So some interviewees even declare that community center were almost like a second home to them. Well, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Ao, uh, as Mrs. C, well, who have receiving meal service from the nearby center said, so we meet friends there at the center whilst having meals together and chat and laugh together. Staff there also provide health talks, which help us to understand some health related information. So they even have a Chinese traditional medicine service to care our old bodies. They are doing a great job there. There are some great people there. So, and also the interviewees also seems to be satisfied with the financial subsidies they receive from the local government. So as Mrs. Yu state, the government is good to older people. So we have a special way uh, for using public transport and we receive financial support when seeking medical services. All of these give me peace of mind. I don't have to worry too much about the issues of money when I need to use these basic needs. So however, the impacts of the COVID-19 related policies such as the social isolation affects the well-being of these older old group in a different way. So physically, so the individuals find themselves less active than before mm -hmm. to the preventive measure. Well, such as Mr. A said, I cannot go out now. I have no reasons to walk around. Well, I, now that everyone is asked to stay home, my family members <coughs> do not like me going out as usual. Yes, that affects me. And also uh, Mrs. F stated that I used to spend some time walking in the park, but uh, was not allowed to do so still to the pandemic. I am now mostly homebound, missing my daily exercise, such as swimming, hiking, and also walking. And psychologically, the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic seem quite disturbing to the interviewees as well. So as Mr. J said, there's no activities at all. I am of course unhappy as having to stay home all day long. So it is no different from a person. So the preventive measures of uh, social distancing also uh, means that many of the daycare centers has to be closed. So this in turn reduces the numbers of opportunities that older people have localized as they had before the pandemic. So um, based on the findings from our study, we can conclude that the key factors to well-being at the advance of age, including maintaining functional abilities, both physically and mentally, maintaining positive to, happy, say, to live a happy mm -hmm. life, appreciating support uh, the societies. Well, however, our participants have also expressed some challenges because of the COVID-19 pandemics. That includes also relationships, activity restrictions, mm -hmm. their psychosocial and also health uh, well-being.
However, based on our observations, actually our interviewees did not seem to be extremely anxious in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Rather, they simply felt uh, disturbed by some of the COVID-19 related policy, limited their mobilities and social gatherings opportunity. Well, however, our objective measurements so that the amounts of our participants' daily activities levels actually were quite good. It seems that they have not been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And and the average amounts of the uh, MVPAs well, was above the beneficial recommendations of 115 minutes per week recommended by WHO. Well, so although the GBS data indicate that the vast majority of participants did not go far from their apartment. So, and based on the funding, we believe that the service provider and the policy maker should make relevant uh, resources available to allow the older souls to remain active. So uh, they may consider adapt, adopting the concepts of e-health to minimize the impacts of social distancing and policies due to the COVID-19. So, and this figure just illustrates this um, smart health platform for older people to enhance their healthy. So, and this healthy system should be able to detect prevents and also uh, managing older people company health problems and enhance the physical and social activities level. So, and this system should connect the older people to their caregivers and also their family, as well as to connect the nearby community so as to enhance the physical activities levels as well as their participations to different social events. So um, that's all for my presentations. And finally, I would like to thank my research team and this picture so my research team, and also particularly thanks for Six Sigmunds, a local NGO, was actually Six Sigmunds supports, uh, financially support this um, project. And we are now collect the second wave um, of the data amongst the exact, uh, exact um, this group of participants. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Liu, for your very informative and fruitful presentation. Well, it's interesting to know that the key factors to well-being at the advanced age from the Hong Kong study, that apart from maintaining physical and mental functional ability and having a positive outlook of life, appreciating support to the societies is also an important factor. So I learned that Positive attitude and appreciative mentality are key factors to live long and happy. No wonder why Hong Kong people live the longest, you know, among men and women. So um, I would like to thank all the speakers for your excellent presentations, very informative and eye-opening. So um, now it's time for question and answer. Um, we, we have about 10 minutes for discussion. So uh, here I have a question for all the speakers. Can you please summarize on how your research findings or your projects can contribute to your society in helping people to live longer or preparing your country to cope with this drastic number of centenarians? So would all three speakers, um, you know, thank you. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Professor Ogawa. Yeah. And uh, I agree uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Mauro in Japan. Uh, we uh, very very difficult to get the good data uh, on the centenarian studies because uh, the privacy is a very important factors for the uh, society now and the uh, uh, prohibited of the uh, pri uh, privacy issues uh, and the, our uh, researchers cannot uh, access easily to the a centenarian now. Uh, this is a, a basic uh, background of the uh, research difficulties. But 
we get many uh, good ideas uh, from the uh, centenarian um, by themselves uh, because and they are contact with the uh, care care workers in the facilities and uh, uh, they can uh, talk about uh, some kind of uh, uh, requirements and uh, we can access to the uh, care workers and get the information and they're making the, some uh, new innovative uh, ideas and uh, actualize uh, the uh, very uh, personalized uh, resolutions uh, for the uh, centenarians. Uh, this is a Japanese way now. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe from Dr. Titamenti. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, in, in many cases, the, 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 the answer depends on the reason why the person has a, a, a problem. Say, for example, um, we, we noticed that uh, a lot of people, uh, almost everyone has problem in transportation but you can find different reasons for uh, problems in transportation. For example, you have uh, uh, people with dementia in terminal status and they do not move at all. And there's no reason in, in, in carrying them in one place or another. While in other cases, uh, it is important uh, to have uh, people move and I think that it's also it would be in, in important uh, in someone who coaches them in move, going out not only stay at home because you uh, uh, for example you 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 you, you feel that you can um, fall uh, reason uh, one uh, one of the main reasons for which uh, elderly person do not go outside is, is because they have fallen once and they fear uh, for another fall. So it would be important to find uh, uh, a way to motivate them to go outside and possibly to use, for example, uh, technological advances to um, help them uh, in staying on, on the right ways there. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Liu? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think based on the finding from my study, maintaining the optimal functional capacities of the older souls, both physically and psychosocially, is the most important. So I think both the service providers and also the policy maker should mix the relevant resources to maintain physical access for older people, while they may consider to use some technologies such as the smartphone, the smartwatch, because those technologies can help older people or even their care providers or their, uh, I mean, the service providers or caregivers to maintain, to, to monitor the levels of their activities, uh, the, the, the levels of their activities, and also monitor well how far they go beyond, um, or how far they, uh, how, how far they go beyond where they live. Well, so as we monitor, they actually have enough uh, space mobility at activity space mobility, well, to see how, um, how many social participations they have, okay? I think this is important to maintain the health of the older souls in Hong Kong. Hmm. Thank you so much. I have another question here. How can the experience from COVID help in adapting the three-stage life to preparing for 100 year life. For example, accelerated digitalization, flexible working. So again, this question is to all the three speakers.
Yeah. And in Japan, and I'm now uh, studying uh, the uh, resident uh, long-term care uh, for the older persons in mm -hmm. Japan, uh, Thailand, and Indonesia. And uh, uh, the COVID-19 attacked uh, our society very severely. But um, many people uh, find out uh, the good uh, resilience and uh, uh, well, fighting uh, against uh, COVID-19. And for example, uh, care workers uh, for, for the uh, older persons uh, are aware of the very uh, useful of the uh, ICT technology now. And they uh, uh, construct uh, the new concept of the uh, contactless uh, care method. And this is uh, uh, using uh, the some uh, ICT uh, sensors and then making that uh, no touching the uh, clients uh, uh, and uh, watching uh, their situations uh, with the uh, sensors, and also the, uh, the they can uh, operate uh, robots uh, and uh, making some new services uh, for the older persons with uh, their uh, good uh, qualities. And this kind of a new uh, smart care is occurring now in a. Uh, long-term care facilities in Japan. And we can uh, find out these kind of good practices and uh, analyze uh, the, uh, how to uh, mobilize these kind of new technologies uh, for all of the uh, long-term care facilities now. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Tetamenti? Would yeah, you like to say a few uh, words? Yeah, uh, um, uh, we, when COVID-19 uh, came to Italy, uh, I lived just in the place where it hit hardest. And uh, we had a, a very high death rate. And <clears throat> we looked at the death rate by age, and we found that uh, it, it didn't stop uh, uh, as age rised. So um, uh, people uh, aged 19 died more than people aged 80, and people aged 100 year died uh, uh, more than people aged 90. So, we had uh, at the first uh, a very great mm, great problem. Uh, we are now investigating what uh, long COVID, uh, mm, uh, what what are the mm, problems in, uh, in long COVID. One uh, one year after uh, the person was uh, uh, hit by mm, COVID nineteen. And in, in fact, we, we did not find uh, any great difference between uh, um, uh, surviving people of 100 years and the surviving people of uh, 80 years, for example. The, the, the symptoms were almost the same. We also, uh, during Due to the long lock lockdown period, uh, we also experienced new uh, new way of doing. Uh, for example, uh, telemedicine, uh, mm -hmm. teleconsultation, and also psychological help uh, uh, delivered through uh, um, uh, through uh, telehealth. Uh, even if uh, psychologists didn't like it very much because they say that personal touch is much better. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So Dr. Liu, would you like to just say a few words? 
Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, well, I think because of COVID-19, we use more ICT, you know, um, information and communications technologies. I think, well, young people have no difficulty to adopt the ICT, but I can observe a lot of older people, particularly the older, at least in Hong Kong, you know, uh, some of them are quite reluctant to use the new technologies to adapt in their daily life. I think the local governments or the service providers have to think about the strategies helping these older people to adapt to technology. Well, I have some participants actually, or my clients actually, they have no Wi-Fi in their home. So if they have no Wi-Fi, how could they use the, you know, the E Health, the the M Health technology? So I think we have to think about what sort of strategies we can support the older folks to use the technology. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Time flies. You know, we have uh, such good discussion and good presentation. And the speakers have shared with us their fruitful findings and recommendations of their centenarian studies, and which are very important contributors to our understanding of the aging process and longevity. So we learned that holistic health that includes physical, psychological, and social health, and also positive attitudes, age-friendly environment, social policy, and innovative services are all important factors to a good and dignified long life. So we used to hear one of the aging myths saying that the older you get, the sicker you get. But from the research findings, it seems that it's much more than the case of the older you get, the healthier you have been. So we can now prepare ourselves with all these wonderful tips. Centenarian studies have and will continue to be important contributors to the research agenda in aging and will no doubt yield more key discoveries in the quest for healthier and longer lives for us all. So maybe is the 100 year old today Will be the new 80 tomorrow? Well, this may be our next topic. So finally, I would like to thank the two organizers, Golden Age Foundation and ACAP for co-organizing this wonderful, wonderful webinar. And my most sincere thanks to all the four speakers for their wonderful sharing and discussion. So I thank you all for joining us and I wish you all a healthy and wonderful life. So thank you and goodbye. But before I close, um, I would like to remind everybody that the next ACAP session will be on um, rise of older people in, um, you know, in September. And also from the Golden Age Foundation, please join us again at Hong Kong time, 2 p.m. That's roughly about two hours from now. There will be another session about nurture, nurturing professionals in long-term care shared by professionals in Australia and UK. So you can just click the same Zoom link to get back into the session at 2 p.m. Hong Kong time. Okay, thank you again. Thank you once again to all. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.